Welcome everyone, I'm Jacqueline Goldsby. I'm chair of the African-American Studies Department and it's really, really wonderful to be able to welcome you to the first in a series of Endeavors colloquiums for this semester. Um, I won't let it go without saying that I wish we could be gathering together in physical real time space with each other at the department's building on campus, 81 Wall Street, in the Gordon Park seminar room where we traditionally hold these thought gatherings, these think tanks. Um, but we are where we are with the pandemic. And there are ways in which Zoom actually makes different kinds of convenings possible um, that actually have led to some having some exciting thought leaders here with us today. So we will run with the virtual space. And I'm, <clears throat> but I don't want to let let it go without saying that um, we would traditionally be holding this in our department building. But we are in this Zoom space, and I just want to point out a few logistical uh, points for all of us to get today. You've should have received the um, message that we are recording this session um, and we will be posting it online so that it's available to anyone um, to think with the ideas that are gonna be raised here today. Um, but for that reason, we would ask that you mute your mics um, so that we can have a kind of clean soundtrack for the recording. Um, and also when we turn to Q&A, but as the discussion evolves and, and moves, feel free to post your questions, your comments, your thoughts in the chat. And our facilitator for today will be tracking um, that space and bring your ideas and bring your voices into the discussion when we hit that part of the uh, program. Um, I just wanna flag uh, for us that this is the first in the series of colloquia that we'll be having this spring. Um, and to remind us all, and especially for those of you who are new and our guests, that uh, there are a couple of unique features about the Endeavor series that's worth naming since we're coming back together um, after not holding uh, the series last semester. Um, one thing about our department colloquium is that it's department wide and other departments um, tend to organize by subfields, um, but we bring everyone together because in African-American studies, we approach questions and issues um, and plan making we want to pursue interdisciplinarily, right? Bringing the disciplines together. And so we bring everyone in this shared space. And another feature about our colloquium is that it's a space for incubating and fostering new ideas, new art, new scholarship, new ways to be engaged in community work. And so we're really excited to be thinking at the edge of what's happening in our respective disciplines, but together um, to, to move the new ideas to, to push the endeavors out, hence the title of our series. I want to point out that this semester we're focusing on breakthrough ideas, breakthrough models, breakthrough provocations that are coming to us from the social sciences. And so we'll be convening sociologists, political scientists, psychologists, economists, anthropologists to really push our thinking about the, the leading issues that are shaping Black life worlds today. And so I just wanna mark some future dates for you. On March 31st, my colleague, Professor Amy Cox will facilitate a panel discussion on the anthropology of abolition, which will bring together really exciting um, anthropologists who are studying the carceral state and state violence. Um, and then we're looking and, and finalizing panels for April, um, where we'll focus on race and higher education and the case for reparations, which as you know at Yale is a very live discussion given the work of the Yale and slavery working group. So those panels will be happening in April. And as soon as we confirm the speakers, we'll let you know. But do mark March 31st, where we'll have Savannah Sange, Sange uh, Chat, Kristen Smith, and Deborah Thomas with us to talk about the anthropology of abolition. Today's panel on black activism amidst community violence will be facilitated by my colleague, Professor Philip Goff, and I'll hand it over to Professor Goff to introduce our panelists today. Thank you so much, Jackie, um, uh, <clears throat> for those introductory remarks and for all of your, your leadership of this department that allows us uh, to have these kinds of conversations. Wanted to make sure that my mute off button has worked. So can I get a thumbs up 
that um, uh, from the panelists, the folks who are hearing me, thank you so much. Um, it, it's a rare pleasure um, in doing academic work that you get to hear from uh, um, uh, national leaders together in conversation. That's part of what we're trying to do this semester um, uh, to in part compensate for Zoom and to create a little bit more sense of, of community. So it's a rare pleasure that we get to do that. It is also a rare pleasure to be able to do that while talking to, to people I've considered friends for a number of years. Um, uh, so I'm mostly going to want to get out of the way. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping uh, and do a, a, a little bit of, of <clears throat> sort of shaping of it. But I mostly want you all to, to get a chance to experience the genius we have uh, uh, been so fortunate to collect um, for today. Um, the little bit of housekeeping, um, as uh, <clears throat> uh, Jackie had uh, mentioned uh, previously, uh, <clears throat> if you can, please mute your video and your mic throughout um, because we are doing a recording. Um, if you've got questions, please, please, please put it on the uh, put it in the chat, and I will go ahead and facilitate that when it comes time to the the Q and A. And for ease of your own viewing, if you if you would like, we encourage you to go ahead and put uh, uh, the presentation on speaker view, um, uh, just as we move through. Um, with that, let me go ahead and frame this conversation that I I, I couldn't be more excited uh, to just be listening to. I know I got to facilitate it too, um, <clears throat> which is this: the past two years have seen the largest single set of protests in human history by all accounts. They were around racial injustice in our public safety and policing systems in the United States, but they went global. Those protests and the organizing and activism that surrounded them, that was in response to them, has not stopped. And yet, <clears throat> at the same time, the, the levers, the pendulum, of uh, sort of racial uh, momentum have shifted in those two years from one of an of a international appetite um, for significant change, not just in criminal legal systems, but of course all the systems that feed into them to one where just today we're hearing stories that all of those protests in fact were a, a fool's errand, um, that they have gone far too far. Um, and that they have, they have asked for and even pushed, achieved too much. The reality, of course, is that while protests um, were massive and demands were radically um, sort of oriented, the amount that has changed is much smaller um, than is in the national narrative. And all of that is within the context of a controversial, controversially affiliated spike, not in crime, but in murder, in violence within communities. And in fact, it is that spike in, in violence within communities that has led many folks to say, well, these new demands, these new policies must be at fault. We must go back to the way that things were. This is overreach. First, let me say that we have to acknowledge the murder spike is real. It is not some form of propaganda. It is not faked data. I specialize in identifying fake data, particularly in public safety. And the most reliable data that you can get ever from law enforcement are those that can be double checked at the morgue. Black communities have been hurting in the midst of the last two years, not just from the pandemic, not just from the economic consequences thereof, but from community violence. And yet there is written nowhere a law that says it is in fact when violence is at its height in communities, that we must rely on punitive institutions to remedy it. Right? The argument can easily be made if police budgets were at their height in the midst of this, why on earth would we need to increase policing? Right? <clears throat> there is a significant question about where and when and how policing as opposed to community empowerment drives down that violence, prevents that violence, even predicts it. These questions are in the context of the long struggle for black liberation. The tension between what do we need to do right now amidst the hell that Black folks are catching, and what do we need to plan for in the future so that there is a future where we're not demanding justice, but we're experiencing freedom. How do we move within that? What are the appropriate roles for academia? And what do we see as the, the, the trends, the promises within activism, organizing, and a collective united voice uh, to demand changes in the, the experiences that we're having right now? I could think of no better group of humans to talk to us about that than the four assembled before us who will then go on to solve all of these problems. No pressure, low bar. 
Um, what we're going to be hearing from in order, Nikki Jones, who is uh, a professor and, and H. Michael and uh, Jean Williams Department Chair of African American Studies um, at, uh, at the African American Studies Department at UC Berkeley. Um, <clears throat> she is one of the, if not per generations, my generation's greatest ethnographers of the forms of invisible violence we have done to Black people generally, um, Black women and girls in particular, that is invisible that she makes visible. Um, <clears throat> she's awarded the American Society of Criminology uh, <clears throat> Outstanding Research Award in 2020. Her list goes on and on. Um, I encourage you uh, to read Between Good and Ghetto, her first book, uh, as well as her many, many articles, The Regular Routine, all of them. These are staples in my classes um, and have, have radically sh uh, shaped the way in which I think about these issues. She will speak first. Um, <clears throat> second will be Patrick Sharkey, who is the William S. Todd Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Perhaps no one has written as careful and nuanced uh, a, a take on what is happening in particularly urban pockets of violence than Pat Sharkey. Um, <clears throat> I, I, will, I can and, and will go on and on, um, but he is perhaps most notably for this, if folks are looking for the website, the founder of AmericanViolence.org. Go there. It is an amazing resource. Um, and I, I cannot tell you how excited I am that he is here to speak with us. Third, Brandon Terry, um, who is a presidential visiting assistant professor here at Yale this year. He's an assistant professor of African-American studies and American studies and of social studies at Harvard because he likes to have multiple affiliations. Um, he is a preeminent thinker um, and scholar of black radical political thought. Um, and I'm excited to hear how he's going to be framing this moment in terms of how black leadership um, can and should be a continuation and a departure of the legacies that we bring with us. And last, but certainly not least, Pastor Michael McBride is a native son of San Francisco. He's got a ministry in Oakland for over 20 years. Pastor McBride is the executive director of Live Free USA, a nonprofit committed to ending gun violence. He is an intellectual leader, a movement leader, a moral leader on these issues and well beyond. Um, so mostly what I wanna do, as I said, is get the heck out of the way to let these folks rip on giving us some more wisdom with regards to these issues where the pendulum has not only swung back, but it has sharp edges and it is pushing us further away from where we're trying to go than we were before the public lynching of George Floyd, May 25th, 2020. Dr. Nikki Jones, could you please offer some initial remarks before we get to this to the Q&A? And sure. I'll introduce each of them, sure. uh, each folks after that. Yeah, and thank you, Professor Goff, for that, that introduction, for the invitation to be here. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, for all the work that you did behind the scenes to get us in this virtual space uh, together. Uh, and thank you, Professor Goldsby, for those introductory comments and, and the invitation to, to think together. Um, I'm joining you here from, from Berkeley, uh, un unceded Ohlone uh, territory uh, in, in the Bay Area. Uh, I'm joining you at a moment that is really a reflective moment for me um, and thinking about what we've learned from the uprisings of, of summer 2020, but especially in the context of policing and, and, and working in, in, in the area of policing over the course of my career and seeing for the first time in, in, in our history where we are, are seeing the, the pairing, the intertwining of uprisings against systemic racism and police violence, which is much different even from seven years ago, the call for, for police reform. And so that has been very clarifying for me. So thinking deeply about what Black activists have always encouraged us, uh, us to do is to see things more clearly, to sharpen our vision, uh, to better understand and define the problem. And, and, and so what are the things that, that I, I know with more certainty, both over the because of the work that I've done over the course of my career and because of, of this particular moment? Uh, first, we know, and I think more people understand that policing is not one thing. And so we often talk about policing writ large, but I think if we just think about the media coverage of the Black Lives Matter protests or the uprisings of summer 2020, uh, and the violence that was freely distributed upon protesters. Uh, and then we think about the insurrection on January 6th and, and people trying to make sense of what they're seeing and the reserve in which violence was held when, it, when, when the mob, right, when the, the uprising, the insurrection uh, was led by white, white people and, and, and to a large degree, uh, white nationalists. And so more folks understood 
that policing is not the same always, but certainly in the work that I've done, I, I, I've understood that both in the ethnographic work and certainly came to appreciate that more in the work that I've, I've done interviewing uh, and studying police officers uh, who very uh, freely share that policing is not one thing and they don't police uh, neighborhoods the same and that the brunt of that violence also, uh, and aggression often comes down on the bodies of, of black youth like those I've, I've spent time with over the course of my career. I think this moment has also called on us to think critically about policing as a response to violence uh, in a way that we that that is 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 much more refined, I think, than we have previously. And, and to better appreciate an argument that I make in in my, in my most recent book, The Chosen Ones, that policing acts as a co-constructor of violence, and that's not hyperbole. Um, and it's not even a radical position to say that policing is about violence. Policing scholars have said this for uh, you know, 50, 50 plus years, that violence is, is central to policing. And uh, in the course of, of my, my work, as, as Phil alluded to, uh, certainly uh, I am thinking about the extraordinary forms of violence and the spectacles of violence that, that we've come to, to see and that, that motivate people. But I've spent a lot of time to thinking about the ordinary violence, the routine violence, and the way that the body becomes an archive for that violence. The body becomes conditioned, the bodies of young people become conditioned to that violence. And I think we have other archives of that as well. We can think about pattern and practice investigations, for example. Uh, and people often you know, want to know, is this a kind of reform that can change policing? And I take a slightly different look at these, these records and, and think about the ways in which it's, it's an archive of the routine violence, of the ordinary violence that is common until it's not, until it's made extraordinary by an act. But then if you look back, you see that the record of routine violence uh, uh, was there. And if that's the case, then you know, I think we have to think critically about what, not the role of policing in, in, in responding to this, this murder, murder spike, this spike in violence, but what is the role of state violence in responding to violence? And what are the limits of that? And so certainly thinking uh, about the, the kind of expanding the narrow way in which we often thought about policing as a response or as a provider of, 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 of public safety. And then I think this moment, what I hope we have learned um, and what I know uh, folks are, are pushing us to appreciate is the way that this moment is an echo. It's an echo of earlier times going back centuries, right? But it is an echo in this moment of very recent history of the 80s and 90s, right? Where we have these racialized fears around empirical facts. So just like Professor Goff said, yes, there is this fight. How do we respond to that? And what is the role of racialized uh, fear? So certainly the, the kind of the, the racialized images of, of black criminality are, are coming to the fore, whether they're explicitly uh, you know, uh, uh, addressed or not. And it, and, it, and it makes it difficult for us to, to really appreciate the depth of the problem. And so certainly there's, we, we think about gun violence as concentrated in cities and among black, black youth and Latinx youth. And yet we know that there's been an increase in domestic violence as well, right? And that that's gun violence. But that's not the vision that, that we are bringing when we have this kind of really narrow way of, of thinking about the problem. And it's intentionally narrow, right? Because it's not actually about addressing uh, the problem. You know, it's, it's, it's about politicizing the, the problem and certainly political power. Uh, so I'm, I'm, so th those are a few things that are, are more clarifying uh, for me moving through this moment and that I appreciate. And I, I just wanna, so I'll close, I'll stop there for now, but just to say that I, you know, I'm really looking forward to being in, in this conversation and learning from the, the, other pan, the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Dr. Sharkey, could you speak to the people a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for having me with this group. Uh, I, man, I've learned so much from uh, Dr. Jones' work. It's, it's, it's great to be on the same panel and to be at Yale, uh, where I think some of the, the best work, probably the best work on around these issues is happening. Um, so I started studying violence because the more evidence I looked at, the more I began to think of violence as central to understanding inequality in the U.S. And that's that's reciprocal. So urban inequality creates the conditions for violence to emerge uh, by concentrating disadvantage in the U.S. by bringing about sustained disinvestment in community, core community institutions um, by leading to a system of punishment. And that's US specific as well. But through these mechanisms, urban inequality creates the conditions for violence to emerge. 
but then violence amplifies and reinforces inequality. Uh, and it does that directly by taking young lives, but it also does that by impeding academic performance and achievement by uh, influencing the economic outcomes of young people, uh, by enhancing mental illness, by undermining communities. Uh, so that's the frame at which I, I started to see violence as fundamental to understanding inequality in the US. And then the question is, well, when we look at what has happened since the 1990s, so violence fell by roughly half from uh, early 1990s to 2014. Uh, so what happened? What brought about that change? And that's why I started studying community organizations, uh, the movements that were happening in neighborhoods across the country. So when in, I think it was 2015, I sat down with three graduate students, uh, basically because we were unsatisfied with the explanations for why violence fell, read all these, these uh, inspiring books about organizations and people who had mobilized to retake public spaces and make them safe for communities to march against violence, to, to uh, uh, mobilize to provide services for mental illness, uh, for addiction, to provide basic services like after school programs in communities that were hit hardest by the rise of violence in the 70s and 80s. Um, and so when we looked at national data, we were basically trying to figure out, okay, we have these explanations for why violence fell, what else was happening on the ground? And we looked, we gathered all the data that we could uh, in cities uh, across the country, and we found the stuff that other people had found. So there was a large scale increase in police forces, uh, there were changes in police tactics. Uh, there was a continued rise in, in incarceration. There was an expansion of uh, surveillance and closed circuit camera systems in, implemented in uh, cities across the country. Um, but there was also something else that we saw. There was a mobilization of the nonprofit sector. Uh, that occurred at a national level. So these stories are told in terms of heroic acts of individuals or, or specific groups of people in a given neighborhood, and they should be told that way. They are heroic acts. This is this is uh, uh, my comments are not meant to diminish the the uh, incredible work that's gone on in neighborhoods across the country. But what I would point out is that this was a national mobilization that took place in the early 1990s. The nonprofit sector, particularly organizations that were formed to deal with violence, but also just to build stronger communities. You can see in the national da uh, data, this proliferation. So what we did in, in that first study where I looked at uh, the impact of, of this mobilization of nonprofit organizations was to try to identify causal evidence to see whether there was a causal impact of the expansion of the nonprofit sector on violent crime. Uh, and in that first study that that we did, um, Delorum Takiar was one of the graduate students, Gerard Torres Espinosa was another, and uh, Kiara Dads, I want to make sure to give them all uh, credit. Um, what we found is that, so we exploited kind of shocks in funding that led to more nonprofits emerging to identify the causal impact. What we found is that in a typical city, a city with about 100,000 people, every 10 additional nonprofits that were formed to deal with violence, to retake public spaces, to provide services, to provide housing, to provide after school programs, led to about a 9% drop in the murder rate. The implication of this is that in addition to all those other changes that get so much attention about shifts in policing and incarceration and so forth, there was a mobilization that took place in the communities hit hardest by violence. That mobilization, the expansion of nonprofits played a central role in contributing to the fall of violence from the 1990s to the mid 2010s. The reason that's important is because when you think about the explanations for why violence fell, or when you think about the reactions to the recent rise in violence, in the US, we immediately go back to this knee-jerk reaction and think about a response that is focused on the institutions of punishment, the police and the prison system. That is the default response to a rise in violence in the US. This evidence provides a proof of concept that a different approach is necessary. The groups that mobilized in the 1990s are groups that were underfunded, uh, that did not have national support, 
uh, that were not seen as central actors in the effort to deal with violence. And yet they had this enormous impact on the decline in violence. They played a central role in that effort. So this observation is reinforced by a whole bunch of randomized controlled trials. Uh, the evidence base has grown stronger and stronger. And what it tells us is that we have had a model for a long time that assumes that to deal with rising violence, we have to turn back to the institutions of punishment in the US. There is another model. The, the groups and the people that have always had the greatest capacity to control violence are organizations that are motivated by building stronger neighborhoods, by looking out for their neighborhoods, neighbors, making sure everybody's welcome in their community, making sure their communities stay strong and no one falls through the cracks. Those organizations, we now know, we have enough evidence now to know that those organizations have the greatest capacity to control violence, and yet they've just never been given the commitment and the resources to do so in a sustained way. So I think, you know, the main message here is that we can make a case for the work that Pastor Mike is doing, the work that's going on around the country on the merits of, of justice, uh, we, we can uh, uh, praise the work that's going on, the incredible hard work that's gone on without sufficient resources, but we can also make an, empir an empirical case. This work is not only a, a how I think the world should work, it is backed up by extraordinary evidence at this point. Thank you, Dr. Sharkey. Dr. Terry, you wanna to speak to the people? Uh, so first off, I want to thank uh, Phil for convening us here and for inviting me. Really honored to be in conversation with you all who I've learned so much from and been inspired by. Uh, I'm a political theorist, so I come at these questions from a bit of a different vantage. And I wanted to open up by speaking forthrightly of what I think is a kind of ghost haunting these kinds of discussions about community violence. And that's the older idea or concept of black on black crime. Uh, community violence is arrayed productively against this earlier once prominent idea. And it's an attempt to replace race based with place based arguments. Um, but for someone like me, who was formed in many respects by the 1990s period that, that Pat is talking about, the decline of black on black crime talk is really fascinating. So it was once a familiar part of black liberal, nationalist and radical discourse, but now is principally used by conservative critics of Black Lives Matter. Uh, writers like ta Coates decry its use as ideological and cynical. Uh, they say it represents an illicit changing of the subject against legitimate demands of anti-racist activists. And sociologically, I think the consensus is that black on black violence concepts lead analysts to confuse the effects of racial segregation for a unique pathology of black people. Think it unfairly ra racializes crime, further stigmatizes blacks, uh, and perhaps even more devastating is that the concept seems to suggest the need for an explanation of why, uh, to quote Alvin Poussaint's book title from the 1970s, Blacks Kill Blacks. Uh, and this, this peculiar demand for an explanation tends to generate uh, odd Black psychology. In Poussaint's form, it drew on the wretched of the earth, and he wrote things like, uh, by attacking a fellow Black, we may feel that we are committing a manly act, the destruction of sin itself. We may express our self-rejection by acting out the white racist wish. So this uh, idea of internalized oppression, despite its origins in Black power radicalism, licensed surprising support for authoritarian and violent repression of Black crime and Black people, as Black radicals themselves became more despairing of the prospects for the revolution and consciousness that might shed these supposed pathologies through politics. Now, given the flaws of the picture I just painted, it's easy to narrate the turn to the community violence concept as progressive and an instance of genuine sociological learning. But I think if we're too triumphant about that story, I think we miss something about the popularity of black on black crime discourse in black communities that might help us to produce a still more effective theory, politics and rhetoric in the present. So I think there's a sleight of hand in the way that some analysts conflate the white dominated discourse about black crime from the 1890s and its obsessions with black on white crime, especially rape, 
with the discourse on black on black crime a century later. The latter was not driven by white racist and black reactionaries alone, but was embraced by all manner of anti-racist artists, intellectuals, activists, from Jesse Jackson to Sister Soldier to Tupac Shakur. And what we tend to miss, I think, is that black on black crime talk can essentially be split into two overlapping but analytically distinct families of thought. The first, which we've discussed already, is sociological and explanatory in its aspiration. The other, however, is normative. Uh, it's about ethics and politics. So in its normative construction, black on black crime reflects views about social critique and moral duties. The argument was that black on black violence was not just a problem, but a matter of justice. It reflects unremedied effects of broader systemic injustice and social abandonment. It intensifies unfair racial stigma and violates basic rights of blacks themselves. Further, the failure of the state to effectively enforce the rule of law or exhibit meaningful concern when blacks harm other blacks reflects a cultivated disregard for black dignity and citizenship. And as my friend Tommy Shelby argues in Dark Ghettos, such conditions call into question the very legitimacy of the whole legal and political order, as well as the demand that the oppressed comply with the law or that they respect property rights or contribute to norms of cooperation. The problem with this critique, however, is that it opens up a dangerous and frightening moral and political void. How can we sustain respect for rights? How can we sustain cooperative struggles against injustice? How can we sustain collective survival and flourishing without the appeal to legitimate law? On my view, what black on black crime talk tried to do was use racial solidarity to fill that void. In other words, it offers an argument to those considering violence or criminal practices which presuppose violence and it suggests that such violence is not just a violation of people's natural rights, but violates special solidaristic norms like special concern, loyalty, the promotion of shared goals and trust. These goals, the framework suggests, are necessary for the struggle against anti-Black racism and the cultivation of a bearable social life amidst injustice. Black on Black violence, on their view, then, is a violation of obligations born of shared oppression. Instead of strengthening solidarity, it deepens and hardens patterns of distrust, makes it harder to sustain cross-class ties, and creates psychological and social traumas that make the work of movement building harder. It also evinces a kind of cruel parasitism amidst shared vulnerability. Now, in closing, and to reiterate, I'm not offering a defense of the discourse, but I'm just pointing out how different it looks from this normative angle as opposed to the explanatory one. Despite its faults, black on black crime talk properly reconstructed seems to take seriously a broad suite of challenges that I think any replacement discourse concerned with black activism amidst community violence also needs to consider. I'll close by restating them quickly as follows. The first is a critique of the legitimacy of the existing social and legal order and a related recognition that certain forms of law breaking are forms of legitimate dissent. Second is a recognition that this critique discloses a crisis of normativity that's severely dangerous to social life and demands a kind of normative refounding. Third is a question of how to be respectful of and responsive to the moral and political agency of the perpetrators and victims of violence. And last is responding to existing normative expectations of Black solidarity and anti-race struggle anti-racist struggle. So I think this helps us see more clearly what was normatively self-undermining about the answers Black on Black crime discourse tended to generate to the incisive ethical and political questions it posed. Its proponents failed to adequately distinguish their normative and explanatory ambitions, and they left the concept vulnerable to usurpation by authoritarian reactionaries. The fixation on the spectacular character of violence, moreover, often degenerated into what we see as one-sided demands for solidaristic discipline expressed by Black elites against the ghetto poor without uh, equal attention to the failure of mutual concern in the other direction. Uh, 
And finally, and most perniciously, it reflects the roots in Black nationalism by permitting the conceptual partitioning of political space and moral responsibility such that Black on Black crime became only a challenge for the supposed autonomous politics of Black communities rather than generating duties of response for the whole society. To the extent that any community violence paradigm fails to pose these important normative questions or reflexively reproduces these flaws, I think will undermine some of the important potential gained in moving from black on black crime talk to community violence talk that we supposedly are experiencing. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Terry. And, in, and by way of transition, I love to move from the ghosts of racism to the Holy Ghost. So, Pastor Mike, you want to go ahead and bless the people? Touch your neighbor with consent. Uh, I mean, you introduce me talking about the Holy Ghost, I'm gonna get excited. Now, um, it's great to be here with everyone. Uh, obviously, um, you know, so much has been said. I agree with uh, all of it. I, I, I would like to introduce uh, my perspective or remarks just around this, this idea that of of my greatest concern this moment presents to me, um, it is around narrative and it is around how we make meaning of the worst conditions in black and brown communities um, in a manner that does not re, um, uh, re uh, cycle the very things that so many reasonable people <laughs> the last several years had an epiphany around. Um, it is a question to me, not just of proximity, but of empathy. It is a question of, do we believe that Black communities belong to the United States of America? Or are we a burden? And we just want Black folks and others to die silently and invisibly um, without the responsibility of the whole nation to fix what the nation broke. <laughs> Right. And and I do believe we are in a crisis moment because, you know, I'm 46 years old. I lived through the 90s as a teenager and I got caught up in being a victim of police brutality. I have friends who have been beat up by cops. I have friends who've been shot and killed by guns. And so while some may have the luxury to uncouple the issue of policing and, quote unquote, intracommunal violence, the overwhelming majority of Black folks caught in these cycles, both uh, directly or uh, through proximity with their family members, are waking up every day trying to navigate the, the, the existential presence of violence in their lives that could come upon them unexpected with no protection and with no security. It is really important, I think, for us to appreciate that it is a false distinction between a victim and a perpetrator. It is about where you come into the story of that person. Will we treat them as the victimized or the victimizer? Uh, violence uh, creates all kinds of trauma that without therapy and support and healing remains in the soul, the spirit, the body, and the mind of the person who's been victimized. And so when we talk about violence in our communities, uh, and we try to divide, even within our own communities, folks into good versus bad, you know, victim versus perpetrator, it really muddies the water in a way that I believe uh, caused us to lose out on the opportunity to talk about communal killing, um, communal stabilization and what must be done to stabilize Black communities that have not spent one day in this country and not experienced state violence at the hands of largely white-led institutions. Now, what do you think about that, right? Not one day in this country have we not experienced the violence of white-led institutions, both governmental, corporate, or otherwise, and yet our angst and our retribution is, is pointed towards the very folks who are being victimized regularly. It is as if we are asking uh, Black folks who are experiencing these levels of trauma to rise above the trauma and eschew the violence that has been thrust upon us without any resources to be healed, to be restored, or to be stabilized. And so I do believe that we have a crisis moment around narrative. I do think that uh, we we all want to be safe. 
uh, in our communities, but the tough on crime approach has proven to us to not be the answer. There's a scripture that says, um, you know, uh, uh, if, if you hear the word, but don't do the word, you are like a person who looks at their reflection in the mirror and walks away and forget what you saw. Well, I want to say that we can't last year all talk about we need to, uh, you know, limit the footprint of policing, radically reimagine public safety, and then allow the conservative forces, largely led by police unions who are in their own self-description, supportive of the authoritarian impulses of Donald Trump and those forces. We want to unleash these individuals into our communities to create safety while they are all the while resisting any form of reform and accountability. These are the folks we want to give more money to. I heard President Biden at the Police Foundation say, we don't want to defund the police. We want to give you more money. Why? So you can do therapy, healing. We want to ask police officers to provide therapy to Pookie and Ray. That's, that's the most brilliant community safety strategy that the leader of this country is proud to publicly proclaim. And then you want folks who actively work on this every day to rob Peter to pay Paul, to sell chicken dinners, to sell T-shirts, to fund a public safety strategy that has been 400 years in the making of a crisis. I do believe, people, that we must be as serious about this problem as we are about killing Black people in this country. This is a huge challenge for our communities in the midst of a global pandemic that has ravaged the infrastructure, the familial ties and stability of black communities and poor communities and many communities. And so I do believe the conversation that we have today is a conversation about politics, it's a conversation about you know, the kind of frameworks we use to describe and to define the, the phenomena that is happening in our communities but it is also about how do we love black folk, right? Uh, how do we love folk into life? Um, and and, and I, I do know, and I'll say a little bit more of this in, uh, later on, but I do know that there are folks within the black community who live in very violent communities and it is they themselves often calling for more police. But I think it's important for us to know that we have found strategies that when people learn about these strategies, they actually will ask for these strategies as well. So the question for us is how do we mainstream and socialize our broader public and conversation around things that not only we know work, but that we know community members who live in these communities will actually embrace and remove the kind of political uh, uh, anxiety of elected officials who claim to want to end mass incarceration. They claim they want to end criminalization. They claim they want to end police shooting, but don't want to do anything systemically to assist in that process. Um, and so I, I am very grateful to be included in this conversation. Um, I, I can go on and on, but I'll stop there because I, I, I would love to, to continue to, uh, you know, have the Holy Ghost be activated in me by these great scholars from these prestigious uh, a wonderful institution. Did you really end with Holy Spirit activate? Is that what happened, Pastor Mike? <laughs> hey, man, it, look, if it ain't got that spirit, it ain't got that swag. You understand what I mean? Come on, man. <laughs> oh, I, I could not appreciate the four of y'all more. Um, what a tremendous set of, of, of opening remarks. What I, I'm trying to, to distill themes and before I get there. Everyone who is here as part of the audience, we do want you to be able to participate. If you've got questions, please do put them in the chat and I will relay them here as part of our ongoing conversation. But as I'm, as I'm pulling out themes from um, where Nikki started and Pastor Mike, where you end, um, <clears throat> one of the themes that seems like it's, it's, ve it's very clear is that the stories that we're telling are lies, <laughs> right? That the, the narratives that we've got are insufficient for this moment. Um, and there are two examples that kind of uh, uh, came out to me, uh, particularly Brandon, as you were as you were talking. One was the tragic story of Micaiah Bryant, right? Who, if you recall, um, immediately after the the trial, Derek Chauvin, she's a young African American uh, girl 
um, who was shot and killed. She was in foster care. She had a knife. It looked in the body cam video like she was lunging at another girl. And initially, because it was a, a black girl, it was a child who was killed by law enforcement, there was great alarm. And the body cam footage came out. People said, well, she had a knife. It looked like she was lunging. What else could the officer have done? It was a good shooting. It was a fine shooting. How can you possibly object? And I thought about that between Brandon and, and Pastor Mike, because the conversation we had at my center, um, a woman named Tracy Lloyd, um, with, with tears in her eyes, said, we wouldn't have that conversation as the only two options, like she was wronged or she deserved it, if, if the people who were in charge of keeping us safe loved her. We would be able to imagine a world where a child who was moved between multiple foster homes, which we know are ripe for various kinds of abuse and neglect, right? <clears throat> if that child's life was not about what they chose to do in that moment, but the options that were afforded to her. And perhaps interestingly, it paired in my mind with the conversation I was having last night, um, about the tragic, tragic killing of a young woman, um, uh, Christina Lee, in Chinatown in New York. Um, and it looks as if the individual who stabbed her was a terrible murder, stabbed her 40 times in her own apartment as a stranger uh, issue, which is a, a incredibly rare, as we, as we know from the literature, um, just sort of the caricature of the worst kinds of murder. But the individual who, who stabbed her was 25 years old. Last address was a, a homeless shelter. And it was in a neighborhood where the, the community had got band together to say, we don't want more homeless shelters because we're scared, scared of homeless people. And it says, if because the spectacle of violence is so extraordinary, of, of, of that physical violence, it's so extraordinary that it blinds us to the violence of poverty and neglect that causes it in the first place. And so with the concerns around narrative, these concerns about what is missing, the levels at which we're not, we're not having conversations, I have a question for, for the panel, and I'm happy for you all to go in whatever order and to speak to each other, which is what obligation is there among Black folks or folks who are championing the Black radical imagination within this space to the white assumptions, the white gaze upon this space. What things do black folks owe to what white people imagine around what's happening in black communities? Because it does seem as if part of the narratives that are, are made invisible are the narratives that are hardest to explain to a white imagination of blackness. So if that question makes sense, I would love for any of the panelists to go ahead and get started. And if nobody wants to, I absolutely will call on y'all. I can start. Uh, my first response is we owe nothing to the white imagination um, because the white imagination is not constructed in the way that we're talking about in the central role of violence in that way. It's not it, it, it's not constructed to, to serve black communities. And I think, you know, each person laid that out, particularly, you know, Pastor Mike, um, you know, the, this this idea that the solution lies in there, I think has been um, you know, challenged again and again and again. And I, and I do see that as a problem of the narrative. And so thinking about this, I wrote an article recently, um, I am a child, right? A girl child's truth and the lies of law enforcement. And it's about the, the, the girl child, and I'm using here the words of June Jordan in Rochester, New York, who was pepper sprayed by officers. And in that piece, I do a a step-by-step -step analysis of the encounter and the moment in which the girl child tells the truth to law enforcement, I am a child, calling them on their, their failure to recognize, to see them. But we understand, and your work as well, Professor Goff, right, that these institutions have been conditioned to misread us, right, to, 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 to not see us. Right. Uh, and so you can imagine that the, the work will, will go into either helping people see or keeping us alive. And the work of keeping us alive is deep in the, in, in, in the black radical uh, tradition. 
right? And in our in our daily practices. And if we think, for example, about abolition and how that's mer you know emerged as a, as a possibility in a way in this moment that it hasn't in a very long time, part of that is recognizing that day-to-day -day practices, not only abolition as a political project, but as a, as a political project that's, in the, that's embedded in daily practices. That act of love that Pastor Mike is, is, is talking about. I know a young person is, 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 is leading down a path in, in my neighborhood. How do I approach them? Understanding the challenges with that, which is something you know, I write about in The Chosen Ones building that world. And one of the things that I've learned from, from folks who are doing this work over the last couple of years, as we imagine, like, you know, the top down, at the top, people have moved through this racial reckoning really quickly. The people on the ground are still doing the work. Why are they doing the work? Because they're doing the care work. That, that's what it means to be a community. It's what it means to care for each other. And, and people, so people are, are doing that work and people are going to continue to do that work. I do think that thinking about investing in that work is really important. The narrative for investment, I think, you know, Pat's work is, is compelling for folks because of that. And at the same time, it has to be a narrative that is centered in, in, in the value of Black life and Black humanity. And those two, right, can often collide. And, and can, I, can I just add and say it must be centered in Black life and Black humanity, but also Black leadership, or leadership of those who demonstrate love, public love for Black people. And so I do find it quite problematic that, um, you know, we, we, we are allowing this narrative around crime um, and violence in our communities to, to, um, to uh, gestate, or at least to go mainstream through the voices of some Black institutional leaders, both political, religious, cultural, and otherwise. Um, you know, it's a fascinating thing. You know, a lot of a lot of the narrative around, um, um, you know, the the the, the rise in crime and, and the need for uh, this kind of punitive response. You know, in the '90s, we know had lots of faith leaders standing up in press conferences with mayors and elected officials you know, saying this is the way forward. And yet we also know that over the last couple of years, events like, uh, 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 what, what was the name of this, this, this thing that the police were doing? It was called um, uh, Faith and the Blue or, or something like that. These, these targeted outreaches to black religious leaders to sit down with law enforcement and craft public safety plans when the average faith leader is not even in relationship with, you know, some of the, the very impacted individuals. And I say this as a faith leader because I had lots of clergy calling me across the country saying, Pastor Mike, should I get involved in this? And I said, if your first conversation around violence is with a prosecutor, a politician, or a police officer, then you ought to probably stay in the stands till you talk to Pookie and Ray Ray, right? Because you don't have enough information right, to be in that conversation in a way that actually will get the, the, the result that you say you want, which is peace in our community. And so right now, as the Biden administration um, rightly has been pushing out this $5 billion uh, investment that folks like in our fund, Peace Coalition, other folks, you know, gave them the information, the architecture to construct, we're seeing right now across the country that mayors have received uh, uh, ARP funds, over almost a billion dollars, I think, of mayor uh, commitments to put ARP funds, American Rescue Plan dollars into community violence interventions, and less than 10% of those funds have even moved into the community. So it is not just even about accessing resources, it's about having the leadership in place at the, at the executive level, at the communal level, and in the neighborhoods that can show that their love for our communities sees them not just as a problem to be solved, but a solution to be unleashed. And that work, I think, is really the next frontier of the Black radical tradition, not just from a scholastic point of view, but what does it mean to radically love Black folks, uh, to be proximal to the conditions of Black folks? What does it mean for uh, intellectual giants uh, in cities and universities to be in proximity to organizers on the ground and folks in neighborhoods who are impacted by this so our work can be braided together? I think that is another part of the conversation of how we collapse uh, these false distinctions and roles into something that could be much more glorious and healing. Thank you. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, I um, 
I'm really taking the endeavor part of this seriously. So I'm, I'm trying out ideas and I'm curious to, to get a response. Um, because I think, you know, there's an amazing essay by Frederick Douglass that I love to teach called, Is It Right and Wise to Kill a Kidnapper? And he's talking about fugitive slave catchers. And what I love about that essay is that it captures a real problem in Black political thought, is that you're always thinking about what are rights, right? What are duties, obligations, what's legitimate? Um, what, what, what do you have to do as a matter of morality? And you're also trying to think about things that would be good, right? So you might not be obligated to do them, but they would be good if you in fact did do them and things that would be prudent. So things that might be wise to do and may be neither good <laughs> nor just. Uh, and I go into that digression just to say, I agree that we probably have no obligation to dispel racist fantasies uh, that proliferate through the population or punitive stigmas against the ghetto poor. But I think it is probably good to do so and probably wise to do so uh, insofar as we think that there is no plausible go it alone nationalist strategy. And again, it goes back to, to part of what I was getting at in my remarks is that one of my concerns with the community violence paradigm is I think it does a lot as an explanatory paradigm because it's coming out of sociology, community studies, social ecology, but it brings a bunch of normative resonances from communitarianism, from nationalism about the ethics of community. And the question is who's in the community and who's not? If we respond to Pastor Mike who says, do we belong to America? The right arguments might not entail entrenching the problem deeper in an isolated neighborhood space. They might be about tethering these things to a broader metropolitan strategy, a broader national strategy. That's one of my concerns here and I'm just curious as to how people respond to it. Because I think um, one of the things that's really remarkable to me about the last 10, 15 years is that all the hard culture work, artistic work, uh, hip hop, film, music, uh, hard political work and activism, I think has done a lot to really change how people think about the agential nature of crime in, in ghetto communities and the attribution of moral responsibility for it. And, it. and I think it's created a broader constituency than we've ever seen for these movements, even though it's not enough to win as of yet. So, so I'm, I'm suspicious of the reflexive worry about it. You know, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, I would say that, that it, it, it is good to do the work, but it does not emerge out of an obligation. Right. I agree. An obligation suggests criteria, you know, characteristics of a relationship that aren't actually the relationship that we have, right? And 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 the challenge that we're confronting. And and the language and the narrative, I think, is really important. We are talking about the evolution of a system of racial domination mm -hmm. in which law enforcement has played a central role, both formal and informal, right? Interlegal, extra legal, you know, for, you know, forms of, of law enforcement. And that's what we are, are contending with, right? And a, a body politic that has supported that in its different iterations over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we do the work because. The same reasons that, that that Du Bois did the work and Ida B. Wells did the work, right? And, and on and on, we do the work, and we have the conversations within, right? That that aren't directed toward the white gaze and move us forward. But I wouldn't say I would stop short of saying it, it's an obligation. It, it really is about saving our own lives. And I, and I, and I don't say that in a hyperbolic sense at no. all. I mean, no. I, I know you appreciate that, but when you look at the historical record. That's what folks are trying to do. And somehow we imagine that, that we are in a different moment. And yet that is still what we're trying to do. Right? Yeah, and-, and could, uh, I, could I react to- Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, Pastor Mike. I, I, just real quick, I want to react to another part of what Brandon said, because you know, I, I do find the language of community violence um, as a kind of descri descriptor 
of the way in which violence uniquely visits black and brown communities within the kind of larger context of the gun violence conversation in this country to, to be an outgrowth of how many of us who have been working at the intersection of gun violence, victimization, black and brown communities, largely found our experiences being erased, if not altogether left to a law enforcement punitive only conversation. So as to when you join a gun violence prevention conversation and the only conversation about second amendment, right? <laughs> right. And then folks are like, well, what about these other public health related strategies? What about talking about criminal justice reform within the gun violence prevention movement or talking about uh, you know, issues of poverty and other forms of violence? we were told, well, that is not gun violence prevention yeah. work, right? And so we had to create new language. And I just say all that to say, part of what I think could be uh, an endeavor is how do, we, how do we create new language together um, that actually captures that which we say we are trying to accomplish? And I do think this is perhaps part of the project of building and reimagining public safety by censoring those directly impacted by these issues uh, versus us doing a reactionary um, you know, move, whether it's around narrative, policy, and or solutions to these arbitrary rises and spikes in crime and violence that are often politicized uh, in the moment, but not necessarily over a long period of time um, done as a constructive project around democracy. Uh, because you know, how can one, um, you know, really love the country or the city they're in if they can't even imagine they're going to live very long within it, right? It is, it is almost, you know, a, a decoupling of one's spirit and humanity. And so I do think the community violence narrative is, 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 is both helpful but also challenging. And I, I hope we can endeavor to, again, be very clear about what we want to say and how we want to imagine the world forward when we're talking about these issues. I appreciate all that. And, and Brent, I want to add to and then pivot to a different question, uh, which is a, a synthesis of a couple of that I've gotten in the chat here. Because um, I think part of what you're bringing up is that regardless of what a moral obligation might be, particularly from um, a collective and community uh, um, perspective, um, there is work that is likely necessary in order to achieve certain aims. This uh, group is not called um, black elected political uh, <clears throat> work in the context of community violence. Um, it is called uh, <clears throat> uh, right black activism. And so I'm wondering to the degree to which, and, and Pat, if I can uh, sort of direct this uh, to you, um, the degree to which it is clear what the role of activism should be versus what the role of the state should be in this, particularly at a moment when we're seeing the federal government is putting more money into programs like violence interruption, Right, and that federal uh, and, and state dollars are going more to these nonprofit community elements. The nonprofit sphere has has traditionally been supposed to be for places that the state need not or cannot go. And yet, as we think about scaling responses to community violence, we see the state starting to get involved, which leads to this sort of muddying where there are folks who are saying, no, defund the police as a slogan needs to serve these particular uh, partisan uh, interests versus. It has nothing to do with y'all. Please don't talk about it because you didn't show up at the rallies. So it has so so you don't get a say. So Pat, can you talk just a little bit about um, uh, this moment that we've got where there is funding flowing to nonprofits from the state, and whether or not some of the work that nonprofits have been doing, particularly the work you've been studying, belongs with the state or does it belong with the community? Yeah, big questions. Um, you know, I think of this this topic that we're talking about was created by the state. Uh, this was this was a result of interventions uh, over uh, a long period of time. And I think one of the points that I heard Dr. Terry push us to to maybe think about is how do we how do we talk about this this problem of violence and expand it so that it we're talking about it in relational terms. We're talking about it uh, not as a as a problem that is uh, concentrated in low income communities of color, but as a consequence of a set of interventions that have been carried out over decades and longer. Where and I saw Elizabeth Hinton is in the 
the room somewhere. She should, I, everything that I've learned about this, I've learned from reading her work and other historians, but this is a product. Uh, this is actively produced when the federal government invested in an interstate highway system and subsidized mortgages that allowed people who could afford a car and firms uh, were able to leave central city unions, uh, uh, central cities to avoid big city unions that had become more and more powerful um, when we give enormous capacity to uh, local municipal governments to decide who can live in that space. Uh, so if you like, for instance, if you want to look at, at St. Louis and Ferguson, well, first think back to when uh, the white population of, of St. Louis was subsidized to leave to the suburbs and then formed new municipalities and then zoned it all for single family uh, homes so that their property values rose really quickly and the property values in St. Louis fell very quickly. That's the basis for how you get decades later what happened to Michael Brown. That's the basis for how St. Louis became the most violent city in the country. Those active interventions, which now take the form of land use regulations and gated communities uh, and, and this spatial infrastructure of inequality that the state has built over time. So when I'm listening to, to Dr. Terry, I'm, it, in my mind, it, it, it reinforced in this notion that we have to understand this challenge in relational terms. We have to understand it as a consequence of conscious, intentional interventions carried out over decades that have led to this form of extreme inequality, which then creates the conditions for violence to emerge. When people retreat from their homes, when they've the core institutions of a community are not supported, then you create the conditions where violence can emerge. So circling back to your, your uh, question, Phil, I think it is unfair, I think it is unsustainable, and I think it is ineffective to think of this project of, of responding uh, to these interventions carried over out over decades with a, an, another project that doesn't feature the state, with another project that doesn't assume that we need public funding, $120 billion a year spent on law enforcement. You know, what if, what if the groups run by Pastor Mike and Fund Peace had a $100 billion budget per year, per year, not $5 billion at one point in time, but $100 billion per year. Uh, what, would the, what would communities look like at that point? Uh, and so, you know, I always go back when I lived in Manhattan for uh, uh, 11 years and I was in NYU housing uh, right in Washington Square. And I was not once asked to volunteer my time or my money to go deal with the problem of violence in my community. Uh, and so if we're going to mount a sustained project to deal with this, I don't think it can rely on people volunteering. I don't think it can rely on organizations that are, are fighting for every dollar they receive. I think it has to be a project that is funded through the mechanism of the state. And, and I'll just add to that, that as much as I, I appreciate Pastor Mike and, and the work that, that he does and the work that folks I've written about are doing as, as well, there's a way that that can presume that the conditions don't change so that the organizations are going to be needed to do, to, to do the work that they're doing now. So if we take a step back, we're actually talking about a project of reparations, right? An investment, right? A, 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 an acknowledgement of the harm and some financial redress for all of, all of what uh, the state interventions that, that Pat just laid out. But we stopped short of that, right? Uh, and because, it, and there's a reason that we stopped short of that. And our stopping short of that is what allows the problem to continue and us to have these conversations about, you know, which kinds of interventions make the most sense, right? And, and what we ought to do, not acknowledging that we are not all the same we, right? And the community is not all the same community, right? The politics of the community are real. And those are also manufactured uh, both internally, but also by the state. So I, I think part of, of, of what I've, I've tried to do over the last couple of years is to think in a real, you know, honest way about the situation in which we find ourselves, right? Uh, and if we think about, you know, the, the, what, what Pat laid out around res residential segregation and the construction of whiteness 
and the battle for whiteness right now and what we saw in the insurrection is a kind of crisis of whiteness. Like what is whiteness gonna mean in this country? And that's consequential for black people to the extent we're talking about black people, right? Because it always includes some reference to black people and the condition of black people, whether or not they're not, whether or not they're, whether they are there or not, right, in, in this nation. So the question isn't as much about, you know, are we part of America, right? It is, it is America an America that has the kinds of institutions that can include us. So what I've done there is to take us like many degrees away from what people, the narrative of gun violence, right? And, and building on what other folks have said. And, you know, I say that not to, to stop, or put a halt to the conversation, but just to kind of, to, I really, you know, to really get us, uh, you know, closer to the problem as we're dealing with it, you know, as it, as it, as, you know, as we're confronting it. Yeah, Brandon, I see you take yourself off mute. You want to get in on this? Yeah, um, because I think to this 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 point, you know, we you know we're, we're we're thinking in the aftermath of some really momentous things, and I really appreciate it how you set us up, Phil. Um, it's not just the biggest protest movement in world history; uh, it's also the largest influx of cash into black political black led political organizations in history. And I think one of the things that many of us knew before last month but have all been forced to deal with in public last month is that that didn't go well. Um cash came in, there was an infrastructure to deal with it. Uh it papered over a lot of rhetoric papered over who was making decisions who, what constituencies they were accountable to, uh, what philanthropic dollars demanded in return for their commitments. Uh, that's a whole set of democratic deficits that emerge when this happens in an ad hoc fashion uh, as a dance between philanthropists, activists, and a media climate that uh, gravitates towards spectacular acts of violence. So I just raised that to say that one of the biggest problems for Black activism, one which we have basically no conceptual resources to deal with because it hasn't been a problem before, is like how to manage enormous amounts of money in a way that is democratically defensible, or if not is it's not going to appeal to norms of democracy, give us reasons why we should not demand those democratic norms uh, be shown fidelity to. Uh, the, the alternative, what, what I think Professor Sharkey's laying out, is really a remaking of the state. And again, that's, that's just not a project that Black political thought has tended to have a lot of resources to, to, to try to think, but it's our opportunity to do so, to, to establish a new progressivism that really thinks about what might new and novel state institutions look like as we try to onboard the work of community repair into a state apparatus that might be deserving of the assent and respect and commitment of who are the people who are right now the truly disadvantaged. Yeah, Brandon, I just want to, I want to pick up on one thread of that. I'm so glad that you were talking about the amount of money uh, that philanthropy puts in to black led organizations, black led political power, but it has been to the, the criminal legal space and to the public safety space in particular um, over the last two years. Um, I want to just uh, sort of add friendly amendments on two parts. One, while the, the public rhetoric was about Black-led organizations and the public scrutiny has absolutely been Black-led organizations, the majority of the money that went into the public safety space was not to Black-led organizations, right? Um, and this sort of new problem of a, a sort of a windfall of capital within the space is absolutely new to Black political projects, but not new to nonprofit spaces, qua absolutely. nonprofits, right? So there, there are examples of this happening within uh, the climate justice space, um, within uh, women's reproductive health space, um, with the sexual orientation spaces, 
where exactly the same kinds of sort of uh, cardboard edifices on, on the fronts of nonprofits fall down uh, with, with the windfall of cash, right? And then the ecosystem sort of reconstructs itself amidst that. This is a predictable cycle when we rely on non-governmental, so it's philanthropic, non-governmental resources to get stuff done. And yet I do believe that the narrative that's gonna emerge from this is gonna be quite distinct because of the racialization of this work, right? Um, oh boy, do I wish that we had seven hours to do just this. I wanna be responsive to all the messages that are coming in. It looks like 100% of them are direct messages um, <clears throat> right now. So I wanna make a pivot because I've had two folks ask now about, um, <clears throat> given that we're talking about uh, uh, a tension between whether or not we want community to genuinely lead outside of government, or we wanna be remaking uh, the state as Brandon, uh, you frame, um, there's a question as to what is the role of activism in response, if, if it is genuinely community be, uh, or to be community led in responding to community trauma per se, as opposed to medical community and the state, considering the historic neglect of community trauma, particularly in black communities. And Pastor Mike, I'm gonna go ahead and give that to you first. Well, I, I think the role is the both and, but the emphasis to me, uh, you know, continues to have to be around, you know, both leadership and agency. Um, you know, I think many of us who are in that quote activism organizing space appreciate that every system we engage is one built inherently with anti-blackness embedded in it. Like none of us are like walking around here really thinking that um, whether it's a black, brown, Latina, Latin, Latinx, you know, LGBTQ person leading such institution, anti-blackness is all through that. Um, and yet we know that, you know, we, we must figure out ways to redeem what's redeemable and transform what must be jettisoned. Um, and so for us, it's about imagination, right? It's about how can we um, create new structures within the redeemable parts of these systems um, that have community power, leadership, and accountability at the center of it. Um, not in some kind of ceremonial way, but in a real distinct way. We can fire, we can hire, we can audit, we can make corrective, um, you know, kind of decision making along the way uh, to ensure that, you know, community uh, activism, interest, uh, priorities remain at the heart of these said both interventions and or kind of programmatic responses to uh, both the immediacy of the problem and certainly the kind of long-term trajectory of the solution. One thing we ask often and we wrestle with this in our organizing is I love to put this out for folks here is, you know, what is the trajectory, um, the timeline, the kind of Hansel and Gretel crumbs, Hansel and Gretel crumbs that you put so people can follow along in the journey towards the abolitionist uh, you know, um, reality or a, uh, a, a reality where police budgets are less than, you know, the majority or significant part of a general fund. And we are, as, as uh, Brother Sharkey's mentioned, literally the dollar for dollar investing in both community healing, community repair, reparations. Like, you know, what's the timeline to that? How do we get there? How do we help people appreciate that? organizing along the way, activism along the way is the trajectory of that. And it's very hard when the material conditions of people every day uh, are experiencing the, the, the concreteness of the loss of lives, the, the, the bruising of bodies, the, 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 the intimate partner violence, the, 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 the uh, lethal conflicts that play out literally outside people's homes. Like folks can't think 20 years in the future if they can't imagine how to get their kid to school today, right? And so our task is to help balance the tension between the here and now and the black future, right? I, I hear folks talking about black history. No, we need to talk about black future. I say, no, we need to talk about all of it. But, but not one sector of our work can hold all of it, right? Um, and so this is where I think um, it has to be a both end in, in my mind, both around imagining, around um, uh, implementing, around evaluating, around sustaining, 
Um, and some of that will be done in some of the systems that have both redemptive and unredemptive components of it. And some will have to be done apart from those systems. The question is, can our brilliance, our humility, our collaboration, um, our intentionality help us be able to, to, to change both the near-term and the far-term conditions? Um, I think that is a big part of the work, but I am always, you know, captured by this question, um, Dr. King, how long, right? And I think that is a question for so many in the community. How long must we live in these conditions um, without reprieve? And, and, and you know, um, reparations, I, I, we, a lot of us talk about reparations, but, you know, we don't even have all, every, every Black person in this country feel like, who should get reparations? What does reparations look like? You know, if you're from Jamaica, some folks don't think you should get reparations. I'm like, my God, I, when did that start happening, right? So we, we got a lot of work to do to just bring us together. But I, I do find this to be a both end, at least in how I'm hearing the question. Uh, yeah, I think that's true of this conversation too. Black folks don't all agree, right? People don't all agree on, on the starting point, right? And so what I see that question as a starting point in the same way that Pat's talking about the body of research, I think the body of research on reparations is building up as well. I think uh, Sandy Darity, William Darity, uh, work on um, on reparations and the distinct kind of the, the justifications for it and how it might play out is, is one example of that. Um, I just want to go back to one point, um, and, and Brandon, you might, you know, because of your expertise, you can you can help me think about this. But the idea, I don't think that you're just saying that that Black people haven't been engaged with the making of the state, or maybe distinguishing between Black people and Blackness, right? Because we know the state as it exists is in response, in part, to Blackness and the understanding of of that, right? And so the question for me is how is it that the demands that are being made are incorporated into a, the, not just a state, but that a state that is, when you know, we think about abolitionist imaginings can actually create the kinds of institutions that are necessary for the, for the, the, the population of people we have within these borders now, while also accounting right, for um, the sovereign territory and the unceded territory and, and all that. So that, that's, a, you know, that's, that's a big question, but thinking, you know, acknowledging the fact that even in this conversation, there is a possibility to remake the state, but it, it can't be on the conditions of the state. And that's why I keep coming back to this point that, that we have to confront, confront directly the violence of the state. You can't kind of you know, move around it. And, and what does that mean in a very material sense to take Pastor Mike's point? That means that when a young man tells me that he grew up with the hands of police officers down his pants as a consequence, of this war on drugs that was a war on young people, my politics, my practice has to get in the way of that, has to interrupt that, has to disrupt that because whatever you think about crime rates uh, and bringing them down, that cannot be, be a way in which we do it, right? And so, and, and we know like it's just the history of, 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 of black feminist thought shows us the many, many ways that black women have cared for one another, cared for the community, Right, uh, and so that we know those very material practices in in a, in a tradition of that exists, and so you know I think it is this this both and, but we cannot get out of this th where we are. We cannot do this remaking, this this reimagining, this transformation, without a direct confrontation, confrontation which will feel antagonistic to some folks with state violence. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree with that. I mean, I should I should be more precise where I, I think, you know, look, we have an enormously rich tradition. I've devoted my life to studying black political thought. I think like any genre of political thought, there are things that traditions fixate on because they have to. Um, so so you see in other traditions, like if you take kind of 19th and 20th century German political thought, you just see a lot of focus on how to develop a bureaucracy because they're engaged in the process of doing that. Uh, not a lot of our thinkers were allowed to participate in the active construction of the bureaucracies that we live under. We have a much richer tradition of how to think about the ethics of protest and the ethics of resistance. So that's all I was just trying to say is that for, for our generation of thinkers, one of the difficult moves is going to be, you know, coming down on th this question of, do we need to develop 
more sustained forms of statecraft and how can we rethink the state? What, what is our conception of the state? Um, and, and what might state institutions look like? I was using the progressive era as an analogy because it's, it's one of the moments in American history where left liberals spend a lot of time thinking about how the state might operate very differently than it did prior, right? Getting rid of patronage appointments, um, trying to think about the spoil system, things like that. So just one quick example, you know, do we have a unitary conception of the state that we're operating with, right? Or is the state a jumble of competing interests and institutions, which we might see some element of and use them as a counterpower to parts of the state that we're antagonistic toward? That's just an open political theory question that I don't think we have a lot of debate about right now in this space of public safety. Um, so I wanted to say that. And then the second thing, just more, more directly to, to Pastor Mike's point, which I think is really important. So how do we convince people? How do we, what are the breadcrumbs? You know, use the, the analogy of breadcrumbs. It's like a lot of my work right now is about narratives, narratives of history. And one of my deep concerns is the popularity of what I call ironic narratives, but other people might call pessimist narratives or Afro-pessimist narratives that really diminish the significance of partial victories and treat them as illusory, meaningless, um, non-events. Uh, I think that's really demoralizing to a social movement struggle to to the kind of practice that Du Bois called the long siege, uh, which I think is what any struggle against the history of white supremacy in this country and the current practice of white supremacy in this country is gonna look like. And I think we have to be really careful that although such narratives can feel cathartic because they allow us to denounce all existence in one sweep, that they can be really demoralizing on the ground. Um, so that's one thing I think we have to avoid are narratives that diminish partial victories. We need to find ways of lifting up partial victories while still acknowledging how partial they are. And then the other thing I was going to say is that from, from African-American history, I, I always am enamored with, you know, I'm teaching class on Malcolm X now. I always teach classes on the Black Power Movement and think a lot about the Panthers. And I think for everyone, um, who struggles with the history of black radicalism, one of the things that's really appealing about those two movements, the movement around Malcolm X and the movement around the Panthers, is that they were able to get people who are involved in the perpetration of public space violence to participate in a actively in political struggle. And to me, that just is still the holy grail. That's still proof of concept. That can you, can you show people in black communities, poor black communities, that you can reach folks who everyone else thinks nobody can reach and that need to be thrown away, need to be locked away, incapacitated. When you can reach those people and show their political and moral agency, their genius, their creativity, I think there's just something still spectacular and compelling and persuasive about that project, but it is extraordinarily difficult. I really am. I'm at this point. I, I went from frustrated to being angry that this conversation can't go longer. Um, uh, I want to respect folks' time. We're looking. We're coming up on about 14 minutes left, and I, I swore to all of the panelists that they would have a chance to do closing remarks. Um, so we're going to go through those closing remarks. Um, I par part of me wants to know about what is and isn't new. Brandon, you talked about partial victories, and I, I thought I was in Pastor Mike's church when, when I was saying amen to it. Um, the tensions between what we can get today versus what we must demand for tomorrow, which are clearly part of this long struggle, but feel like they're having a different conversation right now. All of that, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave with this prompt and then ask folks to take just two to three minutes to wrap up, respond to the prompt or don't. But the, the prompt coming in, uh, again, as a synthesis from a couple of the direct messages, <clears throat> we've talked, this, this is a conversation framed around what organizers and activists can do in this moment. Um, and if you could name the one thing, the one thing, the one constraint on activism right now, the one constraint that if we removed it, would be the biggest lever on change that we could do. The one constraint that could be removed, 
Go ahead and name that and then go ahead and wrap up. We're going to go in the same order. Uh, Dr. Nikki Jones, if you want to go ahead and start us off. Oh. <laughs> there, there is no one thing, right? Uh, we are operating in, in a structural context that positions activists and organizers, and there is overlap and there's distinctions in certain ways, has them in a place um, and that that is 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 built in to the work, right? That that has been the long struggle. I'm not a pessimist, and and yet I don't see that changing in the near future. What I know is happening is that the people who were instigating and motivating the work that led to the uprisings of summer 2020 have not let up, and they are continuing to do that work. And what becomes transformative in any moment of rupture is the set of ideas that, that percolate to the, to the surface. Uh, and that's why this rupture in summer 2020 between reform and abolition was so significant and remains so consequential. So even defund as a slogan didn't emerge in that moment, I'm sure as folks here appreciate, it emerged in Oakland years before Right in in response to a very material material problem, and then and then that leads to the certain and the reaction to that is what leads to change. We don't want to defund the police, but maybe we'll re you know think about re re reallocating resources. Uh, maybe we'll think about a, a Department of Public Safety in Minneapolis, which got forty three percent of the vote, which is not nothing, and probably before this moment wouldn't have gotten twelve percent of the vote, right? And so I, I just want to bring our attention to the the fact that that this. This work is happening. This change is is happening, and the people who are closest to the problem are, are the ones who are figuring it out. The question for the the we that exists here, in some respect, and and I'll think I'll say something specifically about the we in the academy, is to acknowledge our role in producing the conditions that we have talked about over the course of, of our time together today, and to rethink how we reallocate our resources. Right, so that we are are funneling the, the the power of the university to those who need it most. So to me, I see that as the kind of um, you know the practice, um, the liberatory practice, the fugitive practice that we need to be invested in in this moment, and is that it, and that is actually most um, sensitive, right, and has the kind of most accurate reading of the conditions in which we find ourselves. I'll stop there. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Pat Sharkey. Uh, so I've I've learned when I should sit out a question and, and listen. Uh, and, and I think this, this is a, a question that where it's better uh, for me to listen than anything else. But what I will say is that as following up on Nikki's powerful point uh, about what role academics play, one of the things that I've learned about particularly uh, my role, what a white academic can play who, who doesn't do the work on the ground, uh, who doesn't do the ethnography that uh, Nikki does, who does quantitative work to try to understand uh, these, these uh, challenges we're talking about. Um, I've found that my job is to relentlessly focus on explanation, relentlessly move past the observation of inequality, the description of inequality and toward explanation. And that's why, you know, I, I go to uh, Elizabeth Hinton's work and, and why it's so powerful because it, it gives academics the tools to say, okay, here's a challenge. Now let's understand where this arose and what were the intentional policies and what were the impacts of those policies and those social movements that led to this form of inequality that we're now seeing. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll stop there and, and just say the, I see my job as an academic to just relentlessly focus on explanation and never stop until I have made the empirical point about what led to this point. Thank you, Pat. Dr. Brandon Terry, final thoughts. Yeah, well, this is a really hard question. Um, and I think 
for me, the, the, the biggest obstacle, and I think the biggest thing that's changed since the last wave, uh, the last major wave of Black radicalism in the late 1960s and early 1970s is the carceral state itself. I mean, we've just taken a lot of brilliant, hardworking, um, interesting people out of circulation in public space. And unlike the era of the great prison movements of, of the late 1960s and early 1970s, it's also really, really difficult um, to organize in prisons uh, in, in, in ways, I mean, it was always difficult to organize in prisons, but it's, it's become in some respects even more difficult. People can't even get their hands on books to read uh, without, without uh, severe censorship and surveillance. Uh, repression and these things have only gotten more intense uh, in the in the wake of the pandemic, where there's been really harsh lockdowns in lots of facilities. Um, and so, one of the one of the problems that creates is that it really intensifies the disconnect that that Pastor Mike was speaking about of, of people trying to connect the the lived experience of people most susceptible to and most likely to perpetrate. Um, what we're calling community violence uh, and the politics that emerge from it. And we haven't really been able to develop. There's some great experiments in this, but there, there, there hasn't been a, a strategy that, that quite seems scalable as of yet about how to overcome that, the repressive function of, of the carceral state uh, on radical politics in this moment. So, so that would be the biggest thing. And I think as, as academics, you know, one of the things we can contribute to that project is really doing the hard work of normative analysis uh, to try to, you know, the old work of critical theory, clarifying the struggles of the age. Like, let's really clarify what people are arguing, why they're saying things are unjust, what kinds of norms they're appealing to, what are the differences between duties, uh, goods, uh, and just prudential considerations, why those might matter, because they help open up the space of persuasion for allies we're asking to risk a lot in, 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 in the struggles against um, uh, authoritarianism, whether it takes the form of the prison or where, whether it takes the form of the anti-democratic movements we're seeing insurgent today. Thank you, Brandon. And last but certainly not least, Pastor Mike. Um, I, you know, this, this question about what is one thing I'm like, Dr. Jones, uh, you know, uh, and I say, God, I mean, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we got to start at least with three things, a good, good preacher, you know, in me, but, but I, I do worry about isolationism, you know, like, um, that, that we can, we can become isolated in our silos. Um, by just the rigor of the work that we are all called to do uniquely, and and that isolationism creates, um, you know, a, a level of of incompatibility over time where we just can't even we can say the same word but not mean the same thing. And so, you know, I wonder like, can we can we walk together? Um, how can we walk together? You know, I, I'm finding this to be the biggest challenge in our movement space post the Ferguson uprising, et cetera, or Black Lives Matter, however you want to describe it. Um, we, we, a lot of us aren't walking together anymore. And, and that's just within one part of the movement. Like, how can we walk together as, you know, across disciplines, across the academy, across religious, you know, movements, across, uh, you know, elected officials? It's like, how can we walk together? And it is frightening to, to for me to think about these, authoritarian impulses sweeping the country and we who are in its crosshairs can't figure out how to walk together not in some kumbaya way but just in a relational manner where we can have a conversation over time and do the dreaming that we all say we want to do right it's not to me about intentions it's just about how can we just functionally walk together in this capitalist economy that you know, makes us all have to write papers, preach message. Like, you know, I, I got to get a, a new thing to say every week, right? <laughs> the same message every week differently, right? A capitalistic endeavor, somebody's name there, right? Or got to figure out a new organizing plan every week, every month. 
And that work in and of itself, it I think often keeps our relationships from being um, both deep, deep and 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 um, life giving. So that that's what I would say. Um, and I I do believe we have massive opportunities, uh, but it is still early. Um, these same opportunities could become Trojan horses to continue to you know fund the state, the incarceral state, the the police state, all these things that we know are problematic. And so I do hope. Um, that uh, as we continue to lean into this moment, um, we can maximize these opportunities to, to, to both recreate, but also uh, dismantle those things that, that cause us harm. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me though, Dr. Phil and everybody. See, I thought we were, we were so close. We were so close to getting out of one session together with no Dr. Phil references. And yet there at the very end, <laughs> my brother, man. <laughs> Um, this has been such a nourishing conversation. Th thank the, the four of y'all. Before I let folks go, I want to make sure that we get a special shout out to Vanessa Epps, um, who helped uh, get all the logistics of this together, make sure that our panelists were here. Um, <clears throat> you know, she, she made all of us look significantly uh, better than we would have otherwise. So thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you all to coming, for, for coming. I cannot wait for the next and the next of these endeavors, but please join me, raise your hands, take yourselves off mute um, and thanking our panelists uh, for sharing their wisdom and their brilliance with us today. Thank you all so, so, so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.